see why I spread it out to all the Vol uh, websites or social media sites. Have you seen that? We've been getting like a thousand views and all this for this. Oh, nice. Yeah. You may have just heard about the highly rated interview segments that I do with my my next guest, Caleb Calhoun of AllForTennessee.com, which uh, I'll tell you what, I, before we begin, fan sided. I mean, right there when you hear fan sided, you think, okay, typical, you know, of all that you're going to be delusional when you hear fan sided. But I got to hand it to Caleb Calhoun because I really think he does has a lot of journalistic ethics and more so than many people covering the Tennessee Volunteers uh, in more traditional media outlets. And I've always said that, and that's why I like having Caleb Calhoun on, and that's why some former Vols uh, commentators have not been on the airwaves and said, what about this guy? What about that guy afterwards? But I'm trying to think of who became politicians later on. And I mean, Heath Shuler, who was very prominent in Congress at one time, uh, State, uh, you know, and such. And I remember actually, I, I can't, I can't now tested Senate race that year. Remember that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's changed my mind in the house, and a mom mentality against them. Not for firing DJ Gerson, but for waiting 24 hours and then changing their mind and, and then deciding to fire DJ Gerson. Let's just talk about how stupid this was. <laughs> Seems to local fans that I heard kicked around as being a possible replacement, uh, ultimately for Durkin at Maryland. One was Appalachian State, and another was the cigar smoking Butch Jones. Well, let me, I mean, what do you think? Who's going to, you think Canada stays on, or uh, could we see Appalachian State now have to hire a new football coach or Butch Jones returning? Well, let me be clear. Kevin Anderson was still athletic director. Maryland might go and hire Butch Jones. I mean, okay. this is a guy who said he wanted to make a splash hire on Mike Leach, and he hired Randy Etzel instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so, and Mike Leach, right, but by the way, right now, might be going to the college football playoff with Washington State yeah. without any players. Well, it's one of the reasons why, and we've talked about this, I think Tennessee may have screwed up in looking backwards and said, okay, your internet's out. Wait, you can get us Mike Leach? Really? You got Mike? Everything's forgiven. I mean, I, where would the program be now? I mean, I, I wonder that, you know, and uh, I would rather have Leach than Pruitt. I've uh, made that known, but uh, nobody else seems to be even looking at that. Anyway, uh, Caleb Calhoun. a lot of banjo picking and uh, country attitude and all this. And I said, boy, you really are playing up the, uh, you know, we're the alma mater of Randy White angle right here. I, I didn't realize that that had such an appeal in the D.C. area. And uh, it sort of showed me that maybe they were a little out of touch at the time. That'll work in Tennessee, but D.C., I'm not so sure. But uh, yeah, Maryland's still showing that they're a bit out of touch. Lane Kiffin, okay, well, look, that's an interesting... Seeing his name around there, too, against Charlotte. I would compare it to, you know, the victory against uh, Massachusetts. The only, uh, last year, the only difference there is the long knives were out for Butch Jones at that point, and Tennessee fans are still in their honeymoon period with Jeremy Pruitt. Uh, question that I have, do you think Tennessee wins any of their last three games because I didn't see much in that game against Charlotte that made me think that they would. Yeah, you know, I wrote last week that they could win out, and I would have actually bet on them to somehow steal two of three last week, and I don't know if they can do that now. Um, they're, particularly because of how, why Charlotte gave them trouble, which is, and I wrote about this last week, Charlotte's biggest matchup advantage is they can get some pressure. Lock down the intermediate passing game. Well, Tennessee playing a team that on a much higher level does that this week in Kentucky. Um, I mean, if Kentucky has one strength, it's shutting down the intermediate passing game and getting pressed on the court. Watching on Saturday with Tennessee playing Kentucky, the only thing, the only saving grace for them might be maybe Benny Snell is a little bit painted up, and you know their defense mm -hmm. could give Kentucky trouble. I would. I've already said this week. I don't care where they set the over under. I, I would put all my money on the under for this game. I don't care if they set it at thirty. Now that's <laughs> so an intriguing.
intriguing. Yeah. That's intriguing. I had not thought of that uh, idea right there. But yeah, I mean, you would think that this is a low scoring game. Well, low scoring means close, so anything can happen. I mean, uh, you know, Charlotte uh, in the fourth quarter, had they been able to convert a fourth and one, let's say, they might have been able to make that, say, a, th a one possession game uh, against Tennessee. And I still. Uh, I got some very positive feedback from Charlotte fans, as a matter of fact, who couldn't... I, I like, uh, they could not believe that the running back uh, was about nine yards behind the line of scrimmage with Tennessee loading the box up on third and two and fourth and one late. I just could not, you know, you're not going to be able to hold the blocks that long uh, if you're Charlotte against Tennessee to get a two-yarder a one. So, uh, as I see, and for that matter, uh, the rest of the Tennessee slate... Uh, you know, Kentucky has not won at Neyland Stadium since 1984. Uh, I, I guess that I uh, look at this, and but I see a lot of injuries. I see a lot of injuries for uh, Tennessee, uh, talking about being down two on the offensive line, perhaps the two best linemen out and such. Uh, but what do you, you know, I guess the other thing is we hear the running backs are banged up, but uh, does that excuse using Jeremy Banks like a yo-yo? One minute he's a running back, then he's a linebacker, now he's a running back, and then he predictably doesn't do all that well against Charlotte. Do you think that maybe uh, you know, you just kept him at running back, it might have been a little more successful? Well, I, to be fair to Jerry Poole on this, I think he tried Jerry Banks out of linebacker because Jerry Banks asked to try out a linebacker. Okay, uh, true. And so I think Poole wanted to give Jerry Banks a shot to see what he could do because Banks wanted to find a way to get on the field developed the way they had wanted him to, so I think that's why they moved him back to running back. Um, I agree overall, maybe they overreacted in moving it back too quickly from linebackers, because and we've, I've seen it all from Colin Bill Denise, Colin Bill Dane to say that, um, you know, the Hawks this year at least do have a decent four running back set with Bill Dane, Madre London, uh, Ty Chandler, and Tim Jordan, but I guess if Pru is thinking long term, he's probably right because he doesn't have a power back after this year. Mm -hmm. And assuming that he shores up his offensive line, why he's probably converted him back. Um, I think uh, I, I will say, and I brought this up with Kentucky, I, I will say this. If Tennessee is going to win one of two games over the next two weeks, it'll be Kentucky. It won't be against Missouri. And people forget Ooh. that Missouri is a bad call and a range so quarter away from being 7-2 and two right now. Now, oh, wow. That's... Uh... A very intriguing uh, point, right? There. Of course, they have Drew Locke, and uh, I'd take him over, you know, Terry Wilson in a heartbeat. I think Wilson's all legs. I mean, you know, but yeah. uh, you look at this, and and that's a very intriguing point, right there. And you know, if history, when you you start thinking possibly, you know, you go to a place and you've got a feeling, you know, I mean, if you go to Rutgers, you can be all rah-rah is what you want to, and I mean, they can point to me, well, they were turning two one year under uh, Greg Schiano or whatever, but really, when you go into Michigan, I think that you don't really think that you're supposed to win there. You just want to sort of, you know, that be anything for Kentucky or to uh, the fact that historically Tennessee was always looked at as a football school and Kentucky as a basketball school. quarterback yes anyway yeah and so now that one I, I i think that um having been being the college football historian that i am i read about that 1950 game and apparently there was an insane snowstorm that basically is the reason the ball pulled out that victory that day and even neil and himself admitted after mistake because of all the snow that, you know we saw tennessee being far in 2016 and then in 2017 they go to games well and yes but you don't coach the game horribly but you could still tell like those Florida, we're not supposed to be Florida thoughts were in those players' heads. Okay, that's so, intriguing.
know, I know Jaraguan Tunnel only threw five incomplete passes against Charlotte. I know that, uh, you know, the wounded duck uh, long bomb that he did complete uh, when he was getting hit by a defensive back, but kind of because Charlotte had, it was, their pass coverage was so lousy, I think. Do you think that there is any chance, bar not including injury, that we could see a Keller Christ start? Because, you know, one touchdown, one score against Charlotte, now 200-yard passing game, you know, you really do start scratching your head and you say, you know, if you're down, like you said, to say 24 to 14 in the fourth quarter and uh, you got a guy who put two quick touchdowns on the board against Alabama – do you think about making the move? Uh, you know, what do you think? Absolutely. I mean, my, my question is, and I, I still like Garen Tonda long term, but who are we kidding right now? The guy is not – I, 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 I personally think he's hurt, and the coaches aren't letting us know that, because his deep ball, only one shot last Saturday. Um, I think he maybe took two at but last Saturday, and Charlotte was selling out to cover the intermediate passing game. Doing me was getting completions. They weren't – he wasn't getting much out of it. And the week before against South Carolina, when the ball did have to go to the deep ball in the fourth quarter because Will Muschamp altered his game, he couldn't do it. And so I'm thinking, this isn't the same Garrett Tano that was completing the deep ball against Auburn. And so in my mind, I'm thinking that he, either he's hurt or, or there's something there. So if Tennessee needs to, if Tennessee needs to go deep again, particularly use their elite receivers, I'm not sure Garrett Tano can do it because he hasn't done it well the last three games. And I, I mean, someone needs to ask for an anti and Helton. Why has he not been able to do what he did against Auburn? That Tennessee has decided that their 2018 season, getting Jared Guarantano the highest possible quarterback rating and nothing else. I mean, it's almost like the when I see that that's what they're trying to do, you know, high percentage uh, passes, but, uh, you know, not really going downfield. Uh, like you say, I, I just, I, I don't get it. And with one victory against an SEC team now, the helm, I I do wonder is this the guy really for 2019 and 2020? I mean, I start uh, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll say that the, he, Josh Dobbs he ain't. Just put it that way. Uh, anyway, the we've got to talk basketball season. It begins today. Uh, sixth ranked Tennessee playing uh, Rick Barnes alma mater. As a matter of fact, Lenore Ryan at school. I always get mixed up with Lise McRae, as a matter of fact. There's an interesting story I saw in the Associated Press today uh, about uh, Barnes' coaching methods. And, of course, he's been a successful coach, but he only gets you to that NCAA tournament level, that sort of thing. One of the things it said about Barnes was that he was a guy that would needle you. You know, if you were doing 9 out of 10 things right, he'd talk to you real hard about that number 10 thing that uh, you weren't doing Right. And they're talking about how John Wilkerson from Kingsport is a bit of a whipping boy because he hasn't had the production that uh, a lot of people thought that he may be. One of the reasons why Barnes historically maybe, you know, you get that for four months. After a while, you know, it just grows old and it just becomes uncomfortable. Do you think that that could be any reason uh, for your criticisms of Barnes over the years? Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's kind of the, it reminds me of the Jim Harbaugh grinding on people in football, where, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that after, after a few years, Jim Harbaugh just wears people out, mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty much. Um, that was the way it was possible. with Billy Martin in baseball, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's possible. I mean, you know, you like to fix things and will point to the thing you did wrong, but I mean, like, these are, they do need a little bit of validation when they do things right. And, I mean, I, I could believe that to be firmly true about Barnes. The, if you notice, a lot of the players that have the most respect for Barnes that have had long careers, people like Kevin Durant, they didn't play for him more than a year or two. Mm -hmm. and, and I think about that because Kevin Durant loves Rick Barnes and talks him up all the time, but you're right, Kevin Durant only played for Rick Barnes one year, and they got eliminated in the second round of the NCAA tournament that year. Just like last year. Sorry? Just like last year for Tennessee. Now against Loyola, yeah, like I mean, it turned Loyola. out that it was forgivable, perhaps, but we have the bed. Right, exactly. So I think, it's, you know, I've never like tournament runs. Is, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's based on what he's done the next year after a team that has high expectations. They just never live up. So it seems like a team can play well in this scenario for a year and deal with it. But you're right, if that's how he is, you could easily see this grinding on people and wearing them down. And by the time the by the time they're ready to go the next year, it just it, it, can, it can kind of be deflating. Um, and I don't think it's Barnes being impatient. I think Barnes believes that that's the best method to try to make his players 
better. But yeah, you, you gotta give gotta give them a little bit of positive reinforcement every. Uh, absolutely, and all this, of course, you know, but the Bobby Knight school way for crying out loud did Bobby Knight nobody talks about that anyhow he's Caleb Calhoun he writes for all for Tennessee.com check out the website I think he does tremendous analysis and during the off season I love his takes uh, his historical articles that he does he always comes up with something like every day uh, on hey remember this and uh, you know it's that sort of thing that I think keeps uh, the Vols program in these uh, dark football times perhaps very bright basketball times ahead however but I do think it's one of the things that keeps uh, t next hour coming up has Gene Henley the Chattanooga Times Free Press Home Depot delivers on your terms just say when, where